with uh, Mark Manning, the director of the film that's yet to be released. It's called The Rising. Uh, Mark is an award-winning documentary filmmaker and director of internationally acclaimed films, including The Road to Fallujah. Mark began his career as a deep-sea commercial diver and plied his trade in the world's oceans for 20 years. Immediately following the tragedy of 9-11, he put down his hard hat, picked up a camera, and became an immersed filmmaker, traveling over 10,000 miles across America to make the feature documentary American Voices, an in-depth look at the American culture and psych following the crisis. Uh, Mark then traveled to Iraq. Soon after the Iraq war began, he became the only Westerner to live with the people of Fallujah after the city was destroyed and produced two award-winning documentaries, Caught in the Crossfire and The Road to Fallujah. Mark was the co-founder and director of an international humanitarian relief organization specializing in delivering medical aid to combat zones in Iraq during the war. The agency ran 20 successful missions during the height of the conflict. Uh, your, Mark's decades of experience as a commercial deep sea oil field diver grant him unique insight into this project where he worked for the very company tasked with diving operations on the BP well blowout. His experience in the offshore oil industry, running large offshore operations including oil spill responses and capping leaking subsea wellheads enables him to understand and address the complicated and mysterious nature of the offshore oil and marine industries. As an industry insider, he understands the critical aspects of offshore drilling and major spill response operations and plans. Um, thank you for doing this interview with me, Mark Manning, of the soon-to-be-released The Rising documentary about the cover-up and the health devastations still ongoing from the BP oil spill. Thanks for having me. So what, what, how did you find out about all of this? What made you want to make a film about this? Well, uh, like you just said, I used to be an oil field diver. So when the BP spill disaster blowout happened, uh, <clears throat> it was in 5,000 feet of water. And I've worked on a lot of wellhead ruptures that were in a couple hundred feet of water. Hell, they're they're hard to they're hard to cap when they're on land, much less underwater. So five thousand feet deep, I knew that was going to be a big problem, and I was you know watching it on TV like everybody else, and and realizing man, these guys didn't have a plan for this. Right. So you know we just went down there and started covering the story, and had no idea, number one, how they were going to cap that well, but two, how they were going to possibly clean up that much oil. And that also became pretty apparent they didn't have much of a plan for that either. And then when they started using the chemical dispersants, um, we just started following that story out mainly. And, you know, it, it slowly but surely became a health crisis. And... That's how it began, anyway, back in 2010. And right, so the po the point is, is that it, it's the actual s supposed cleanup that's w worse than the original spill. And of course, the original spill, they tried to deny how large that was. Yeah, at the beginning, I, I think... Whether they were denying how large it was or they didn't know, you know, it's hard to say, but they were giving the wrong numbers, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, once the scientists got involved and they got a camera down there and they started getting accurate numbers of the flow rates, it became pretty apparent pretty fast that they didn't have any kind of mechanical response that would work for that kind of, of oil release. And that's when they uh, started using the dispersants. And... What, you know, when you say it's worse than the oil alone, it's, uh, the oil alone is really bad. 
Right. And the oil alone is a very toxic chemical that has a lot of, of carcinogenic properties. It's, it's, it's a toxic material. It's not classified as one. They actually made sure that that wasn't classified as toxic waste. But it is hazardous. But when you mix it with this chemical dispersant, yeah. nobody knows what, what kind of, of serious chemical properties that has. Because as it turns out, they didn't test they didn't do the test of what that kind of mixture, what kind of substances it was going to create, what kind of compounds it was going to create, and what kind of health effects, both for the environment, for the ocean, and for the people, that that was going to create. But, but they did it in a massive scale. They ended up mixing more than 2 million gallons of the toxic dispersants with over 200 million gallons of the oil. And, you know, that's hard to, to imagine that they could do that without the proper health testing. Knowing that they were going to use that in a spill response and knowing a spill was going to happen. Uh, but that's what happened. Um, I believe it's in this article on Grist, G-R-I-S-T, entitled, The Worst Part About BP's Oil Spill is the cover-up is that it worked. And they say that Mixing the crude oil with the um, the Corexit made the crude 52 times more toxic. The crude combined with the Corexit. Right. That's a that's a study that came out from uh, Georgia Institute of Technology. It came out two years after they did this. So not only did they not do the health testing prior to, but they waited two years before anybody even uh, decided to check. And after this is, was after millions of people are exposed, after all the spill workers are exposed, after all of the uh, shoreline communities are exposed, after the people, uh, government uh, soldiers, basically, that were spraying the dispersants in some of the planes. You know, two years later, uh, a college does a study and finds, not for people, but for small fish, it's 52 times more toxic. So they actually still haven't done the testing for the effects on people six years later. And there was um, one of the cleanup workers, they were, they were being told that it's, it, it's as safe as Dawn dishwashing liquid. Uh, a woman named Jamie Griffin, who was trying to clean up um, what, what she called uh, a smelly rainbow street gunk coating the floor of the floating hotel where she was feeding hundreds of cleanup workers during the oil disaster. Uh, apparently the workers were tracking the gunk inside on their boots. Uh, she was trying to clean it. Even boiling water didn't work. Um, she just mopped. Oh, she was told to just mop it like you'd mop any other dirty floor and some of it was splashing up in her face and now she's got a, a whole host of um, health problems because of it. Yeah, you know, we've heard that. Uh, I don't know if it's an urban myth or not about them saying it was as safe as Dawn dishwashing liquid. I, I, I'm pretty sure they did say that. I've heard that myself numerous times. Um, I am not sure how anybody with an intellect above a kindergartner could say that it was safe as Dawn dishwashing liquid when the actual substance they're spraying has a hazardous material data sheet with it that says it's hazardous. Spraying it on crude oil, which is known to be hazardous, so you're taking two hazardous materials, mixing them together, and then telling people it's safe. I really don't understand how somebody can do that in any kind of good conscience uh, unless you're trying to hide something. And I'm just, I just wanted to uh, refer people to the, the website, therisingfilm.tv. There's a trailer about the film. Uh, under it, it says, what happens to people exposed to extreme oil operations uh, in a fight for basic human rights? Ordinary people are rising to extraordinary circumstances in a struggle with the consequences of grave and hidden threat to the American public. Uh, the 2010 
BP disaster, this film exposes how unchecked corporate power and government collusion has, so government collusion <laughs> has resulted in public health being largely left out of the equation of America's fossil fuel industry. Uh, so it was a foreign corporation was allowed to spray millions of gallons of toxic Corexit, they call it a dispersant, over 200 million gallons of toxic crude oil. And uh, six years later, the burden of proof that this mixture was harmful has fallen upon thousands of exposed, sick, and dying Americans. The Rising is a film and a solution to defend community health. The film is directed by yourself, Mark Manning, an oil field diver turned filmmaker. Um, and so this corrects it, right. The, um, the point of it was to break the oil up into droplets uh, and make it like make it disappear. It was sort of this out of sight, out of mind. Like BP was just trying to just cover up, the, you know, the, the the visual aspect of the oil with the corrects it and make it seem not as bad as it was. You know, I think I think what dispersants do. Number one, let me say number one. Nobody knows what they do because as far as the health effects for the environment and, and for people. Because that, I want to reiterate, that even though on a spill this large, millions of gallons of it were used, and it is the national contingencies plan for all oil spills now, it's pre-approved to be used in their tool chest, quote unquote, they call it. The testing of the effects on humans of dispersant and oil has not been done. So, I think that is one of the main things that we're trying to point out here is that there it's a highly toxic chemical that's mixed with another highly toxic mixture of chemicals that crude oil is and that is the spill response plan and the human health testing has not been done so the other thing that it that it uh, uncovered is that these type of spills cannot be cleaned up they're too big. Right. The mechanical right. solution is not there. The chemical solution has not been tested to see how dangerous it actually is. So these type of oil spills, what, what I think this massive use of Corexit did is it hid the fact that these type of oil spills cannot be actually cleaned up. And six years later, you still have an estimate of some of the leading toxicologists in the country that hundreds of thousands of people are sick and dying from this kind of exposure. But that is the price that we're paying, I guess, to hide the fact that these type of large-scale oil releases cannot be safely cleaned up. Yet we're trying to drill now in 10,000 feet of water. We're pushing to drill in the Arctic. Uh, there are powerful forces that are pushing to drill off of the northern, uh, of western California, off the Santa Barbara coast. And they know they can't clean up these type of spills. We just I live in Santa Barbara, and we just had a spill here so many months ago now. Relatively classified as a large, uh, a small spill. It was a pipeline rupture. It was actually on land, and it flowed out into the ocean. The spill ended up being 250 miles long and 20 miles wide, and they had 8,000 feet of mechanical boom to clean it up. So you tell me what the plan was to actually clean that up. And what the plan is, when you only have 8,000 feet of boom for a 200-mile long spill, you have to be using chemical dispersants. So it is enabling the oil industry to say that they can clean up oil spills. At the same time that the testing for the real, real effects of it are not being done. And I would... Uh, I would put out there that that testing is not being done purposely because if you take that tool out of their toolbox, they can't clean up these size of oil spills. Then we'd have to have a real debate on whether or not they should be able to drill. And what is a boom? What is boom? Boom is uh, a mechanical piece of equipment that is stretched out around uh, oil to either contain it from moving out farther or to bring it towards a skimmer. So it's a way to collect, a mechanical way to, to uh, contain or collect oil in the water. And 
It barely works in calm sea states. A sea state is the condition of weather on the ocean. So if you have a one foot high piece of equipment that is there to contain or collect oil, that means that really it's only going to work when the ocean is only a foot high. The waves are only a foot high. So how I don't know how many of your listeners have been on the ocean, but when the ocean is rough, just put it that way, these booms don't work. When the winds are high and the seas are high, these booms don't work. So at best, they only work in perfect conditions, and there's not enough of it to even make a scratch on a spill usually. You'd have to have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles of this stuff, which they just don't. So I think what really this story is, is one of the things this story is really pointing out is that we cannot safely clean up oil spills. Absolutely. And if we knew that as a country, as a population, then we'd have to say, okay, now let's talk about drilling permits. Now let's talk about drilling in 10,000 feet of water off the eastern seaboard, where tens and tens and tens of millions of people live. And we're, we have to tell you that if there's a spill, we can't clean it up without poisoning you. Will you let us drill? With that information, you know what? If this country says, yeah, we want our oil that bad, go ahead and poison us and kill the ocean and not be able to clean up the spill. Yes, go ahead. Then you know what? Then drill. Great. But I have a feeling we're not going to say that. Right. Um, so let me, this is sort of a side question that I was wondering myself when that much oil is being released at one time from the earth. If that, what does that do? I mean, does that create any sort of shifting going on? I mean, like what? Yeah, I don't know. That's a that's a question for a geologist. Yeah. It's a good question. I try not to answer questions yeah. I don't know the answers to. Right, right. I mean, I you know, because I just, right, that, that's some sort of thing I guess we'll find out maybe down the road somewhere. Um, but you have a campaign, um, and, you, you know, you're talking about running out of cheap fossil fuels and expanding street, uh, extreme drilling. America's oil operations are becoming more toxic and dangerous. Uh, experiments like fracking, deep water drilling, and mountaintop removal put millions of Americans in harm's way. Um, but because government and corporations are not testing oil cleanup methods, frontline communities face the risk of chemical illness when the next disaster happens, just like the thousands who fell sick after BP. If we tell this story and demand that oil and gas operations be proven sa safe for public health, millions of Americans will be protected. The solution is a certified grassroots training for medical personnel to diagnose chemical illness shown in the film and happening right now. Um, so the campaign, number one, is to prioritize public health, give a voice to the silenced and sick victims, uh, back programs that prepare at-risk communities and support training for medical personal professionals to diagnose and treat chemical illnesses. And I just wanted to ask, in the trailer at the very beginning, it shows that the people speaking out are having their lives threatened? Yeah, that's, that's an unfortunate thing that we're finding pretty common in, in the Gulf states right now. Uh, so that was, that was a... That was a lot you just said, and I would like to just, you know, you're reading what's on our site, and I really appreciate yeah. that, but I'd like to just explain that out a little bit. Sure. Uh, yeah. Our campaign is going to be launching in, in a couple of weeks from this recording. I'm not sure when it's going to air. Uh, probably at the end of June, we're going to launch the campaign. And it's an awareness campaign and, and a little bit of a fundraising campaign to finish this film around the issue that public health has largely been left out of the equation, I would venture to say purposely, for a lot of these extreme oil operations. Yes, I think fossil fuels are, are the easy fossil fuels are running out, the shallow wells that flow at their own flow rates with their own pressure. So we're beginning to do what's called extreme oil operations, and you can classify that in a number of ways, but I would just say they're extremely dangerous. We're having to go deeper, we're having to use more toxic chemicals, and we're having to go into much more hostile environments like the Arctic, like 10,000 feet of water, and like using these high, 
highly toxic mixtures of chemicals to frack. So what are the risks of those operations? That, that's what we're putting forward. What are the real risks? And, and I'm, I'm telling you that we don't know. We purposely don't know. As we heard often from, from Congress people, from people on the regulatory agencies, from doctors, from toxicologists, from lawyers, it's a willful negligence. I mean, not a willful negligence, a willful ignorance. It's a willful ignorance. We don't want to know because if we knew the real health effects, then there could be serious legal and medical ramifications for these operations and they could potentially become too costly. So the health effects are being purposely left out. If somebody tells you today that fracking is safe, it, you, what you can know for sure is they don't know that to be true because the real testing is not being done. There are over five or 600 compounds in the chemicals that they're using in those fracking fluids. When they test the water, they're testing for about eight or nine. So the tests aren't accurate. They're not sufficient to know whether it's safe or not. And again, in the mountaintop removal, what are the effects of the water supplies downstream? I can tell you we don't know because we're not doing the real testing. So I think that people have a right to know whether you're Republican, whether you're a Democrat, whether you're pro-oil, whether you're anti-oil, you have a right to know whether what you're drinking downstream from a mountaintop removal operation, next door to a fracking operation, whether you're eating food that's being watered with fracking water, whether you're downwind from a refinery, it goes on and on, right? You have a right to know whether or not it's safe. And that's what we're saying, that, that the right to know what you're drinking or eating that has been affected or exposed to extreme oil operations. You have a right to know whether that's safe. It's not a privilege. You don't have just a privilege to know. You have a right. right. And right now, I can guarantee you, wherever you are, whatever your political persuasion is, you don't know because the testing is not being done. And that's what we want to point out here. And along with, sorry, the consequences. Because people are really sick. Yeah. Chemical yeah. exposure is a horrendous experience. It creates horrendous symptoms up to death. And the people that we're talking to, the thousands and thousands of people we're talking to that are sick are suffering, really seriously suffering. And it's not okay. And do, do you believe that BP knows or that they, they are in willful ignorance also so then that they can turn around and just say that they didn't know? Because um, in the readings that I've done, the, um, the Corexit came with these binders, you know, explaining the, the, you know, the toxicology of this Corexit and that BP told um, the supplier to stop sending the binders with the Corexit. And they were, you know, telling the spill workers, uh, you know, you know, people that it's safe, like they didn't need any, any kind of protective clothing while they were doing the cleanup. I mean, just simple, basic things. Uh, BP was supplying people with, I, I believe, gloves and um, coveralls, but um, no respirators. When people were asking for respirators, uh, one worker was told they were going to be fired if, if he, he asked for some kind of um, protecting. Yeah, we heard that often that people were threatened if they asked for the proper equipment. Uh, so this is a big question you're asking. Does You started, I think, by saying, does BP know? Right. So let's change that question and and ask, could they know? Let's start there. Or they should could, know, I mean. Well, that's the next one. But the first one would be, could they know? So I think that's obvious. They have the resources. They're, they're one of the most powerful corporations on the planet. They're one of the most wealthy corporations on the planet. They can hire the best people. So could they know how dangerous is it? Do they have the resources, the expertise, the personnel, the contacts to find out how dangerous this is? Yes. So I think that's an obvious answer, right? Then, then it goes to your next one. Should they know? Yeah. <laughs> so 
if a co corporation is going to engage in this kind of industrial chemical operation, which is what a spill response is now, it's an industrial chemical operation, should they have to know and prove how dangerous that is for the people involved, for the very people they're putting on the front lines using the chemicals? And I don't know how the answer to that is not yes. So could they? Yes. Should they? Yes. Do they? Now you run into a wall, right? Do they? Did they do the testing? If they did, they didn't tell us. And do they know and are doing it anyway? You know, that's... That's an unknown. You'd have to get the, the head of the operation to tell you the answer to that. But I think you don't have to go much farther beyond could they and should they to really understand what's going on because they didn't give all of their people the proper chemical exposure treatment pre-test. They didn't give them the training for a chemical exposure operation. They didn't test them afterwards, and they didn't follow up with everybody that was sick. Um, and I'm just going to refer to this article by uh, Gris.org, what BP doesn't want you to know about the 2010 spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, it reads, you know, I mean, now it's, uh, what, six years later. The BP disaster has been largely forgotten, both overseas and the U.S. Um, popular anger has cooled. The media have moved on today. Only the business uh, press offers serious coverage of uh, what the Financial Times called the trial of the century. So it's um, the trial now underway in New Orleans where BP faces tens of billions of dollars in potential penalties for the disaster. And as for Obama, the same president who early in the BP crisis blasted the scandalous close relationship between oil companies and government regulators two years later, ran for re-election boasting about uh, how much new oil and gas development um, his administration has approved. Uh, such collective amnesia may seem surprising, but there may be a good explanation for it. BP mounted a cover-up that concealed the full extent of its crimes from public view. The cover-up prevented the media, therefore the public, from knowing and above all seeing just how much oil was gushing. Um, so, right, um, you know, their fines include $4.5 billion. Again, like, no one ever gets arrested. Like, no one ever goes to jail. That, you know, they, they get fined. They should be shut down even. Like, they don't even get closed down. Yeah, now you're on to the other subject of, of corp corporate power over our government, right? Right. And that's the other thing that we're covering in this film is the capture of the U.S. regulatory agencies. So predominantly controlled by industry people and industry money. So the studies, again, you go back to the question of how can a corporation spray two million gallons of a toxic chemical over hundreds of millions of gallons of a toxic chemical and not put out any health warnings. <laughs> much less evacuate people, much less provide hazardous material, I mean hazardous uh, suits, hazardous chemical suits to the people doing the work. Uh, how does that happen? So I, I think we generally know that corporations have control of our government, but I don't think we know how deep it is yeah. and how smelly it is, for lack of a better word, that the, the corporate, a lot, a lot of corporations give their executives a million dollar bonus if they can get a position on a regulatory agency. And a lot of these regulatory agencies that oversee the funding to, to health surveys, the funding to chemical safety testing and all these things are controlled by industry people. So there's your collusion, right? And these kind of tests are never going to happen unless that kind of power is taken away from the corporations and given back to the people. And the one thing I think is so powerful about that film is this is all sort of an esoteric conversation we're having here. You and I are both sitting in shelter and we're both warm and healthy probably. And, but the, what's happening to the people, the real harm of these things isn't just talk. It's babies being stillborn. It's people having epileptic seizures. It's yeah. little children with rashes all over their bodies that never go away. You know, one of the girls in our film, they call her scab girl. Yeah. She has scabs all over her body. 
the, the kids who just have nosebleeds and coughing attacks and panic attacks. I mean, it goes on and on and on. These are real life harm that's happening from these corporate control of these regulatory agencies that we don't intend to connect it to. You know, it seems like, oh, that's a bad thing, but I'm going to go on my way. I'll go to Starbucks and get my coffee. I've got to go to work. I've got to feed my kid. You know, it's yeah. like we don't see the real harm. Uh, and that's right. I think what's been exposed so much by this BP story, the BP spill, is that there is real harm to this. There is real harm. And right now there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of American citizens that are being pretty much expended for our oil addiction here. This, we're saying now, you know what? U.S. citizens are expendable. Before, there was an argument to say where we were saying other people in other countries are expendable. Now it's gotten to the point where we're saying, well, Americans are expendable too for our addiction to oil and, and for corporate addictions to oil profits. We're now saying people are expendable. And I don't know, for me, that's, 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 not, that's not a good thing. Right. I think right. that this, I just want the information on the table. I'm not smart enough to say this is what we have to do next, you know, except what I'm saying is let's get all the real information on the table. Let's stop hiding the truth. Let's stop hiding the real harm and the real consequences. Let's put all the information on the table, and then as a society, let's have a rational discussion about what we're willing to do for oil. But it's being hidden right now. That's why we're calling this the rising, by the way. The truth is actually rising up. The oil rose up from 5,000 feet of water, and with it, the truth of this situation. You know, see, that's, um, you know, I, I, I interview a lot of people. Uh, I, I interviewed William Binney three times, the um, the former math coder at the at the NSA, and he's said it um, numerous times that the government sold the people out for profit. I mean, he said it about the NSA that it's it's all about money. the The NSA gets more money the more problems there are. So it's actually like in the business of creating terrorism rather than you know, trying to stop it. And um, so, you know, I, I, a lot of people say, you know, in different sort of categories, but ultimately like saying the same thing. It's just corporate profit over the people. And, um, and you know, exactly, you know, trying to really drive it home that, like the woman in the trailer said, you're either at the table or you're on the menu. I mean, you you know, you can't put it like any other, you know, any simpler. Um, yeah. So um, actually, okay, let me just read. So the financial implications now, the trial underway in New Orleans, wrestling with whether BP was guilty of negligence or gross negligence for the Deepwater Horizon disaster. If found guilty of negligence, they would be fined under the Clean Water Act $1,100 each for a barrel of oil, oil that leaked, but if found guilty of gross negligence, which um, a cover-up would seem to imply, BP would be fined $4,300 per barrel, almost four times as much for a total of $17.5 billion. Uh, that large a fine combined with additional $34 billion that the states of Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, and Florida are seeking could have a pow powerful effect on BP's economic, at their economic health. Um, and yet the most astonishing thing was that the cover-up was carried out like right in plain sight. Like Im immediately they just started with this correct yeah, and I, I would say, you know, I'm following some of these. You have to be a, a lawyer, really, to follow these legal things all the way through. But it, it's been something I've been watching. I have friends that are lawyers in Louisiana that are involved in this particular area of law. I, I really can't get into a big yeah. law discussion around these, right? You get to, But I will tell you this, that... All of this talk about fines per barrel of oil, all this money that's going to the states for whatever. My question is, where is the discussion about the human health effects of this? Exactly. Where right, the is that? real cost, right, the real cost. The real cost. Exactly. So we can say, yeah, $4,300 a barrel, right. and your shareholders are going to lose $7 right. a share, and 
Maybe the CEO isn't going to be able to take his 19th va golf vacation. He's going to have to cut two of them. But where is the real cost? Where is the, the mandate that comes down and says, we're going to have to take $40 billion and do a, a real health study of the people affected, real tissue samples, real in-depth science about the effects of this, the long-term health effects, the links, the causal links to the leukemias, to the melanomas, to the kidney failures. Where's that discussion? And the and deaths. It's not, it's not happening. And that's where the lady says you're either at the table or on the menu. And if they're not talking about the health effects, all these financial fines are just going, as my, as my friend said, from the system to the system. They're not going to the people. And so what is the real harm here? What is the real harm? Is it really, are we saying this is financial? That this, the only harm here is financial? So what good does it do to a person who's dying of kidney failure to find BP $20 billion and give it to seven states? And then they spend that on highways or they spend that on whatever. That doesn't make, that doesn't affect anybody. The sick, because none of this money is going to health. It's not going to treatment. It's not going to research. It's not going to make sure this doesn't happen again as far as the health effects. So to me, it's smoke and mirrors. It's a bunch of smoke and mirrors so people can think something's being done when actually nothing is being done about the toxic effects of these operations at all. That's the harm. And, and that, that's what uh, aggravates me about all this talk about the big legal settlements. It's just money. Right. And, um, I, you know, I, I've done a lot of shows and a lot of interviews, uh, you know, economic uh, and all that, uh, and exactly what money is and where it's, it comes from and that it's created out of debt. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I believe because money isn't even real. I mean, it doesn't come from nature. So it, it really uh, kind of creates... Um, you know, it makes people unhealthy. I mean, especially corporations that are like addicted to this kind of, you know, man-made money at the expense of, right, real health, the environment, people's lives. Yeah. So, you know, what if, what if there was a simple settlement? <laughs> you know, you got to go to the people that are sick and you got to spend the money to find out why they're sick and the treatment they need, by the way. Because none of the people that are sick are getting the treatment. No diagnosis for the actual harm, which is chemical exposure. So if you're not determining causation of, of the disease, if it's chemical exposure, which created chemical illness, then they're not getting treated for chemical illness. So the people that do have health insurance that are sick are going in and getting treated for their symptoms. If a kid has a bunch of rashes all over her body from chemical exposure, but the doctor's not treating for that, He's going to give her antibiotics, which is more chemicals. And antibiotics have no effect on chemical illness. So the people that are sick are not getting the treatment they need because the research into why they're sick is not being done because the actual, you know, is covered. So not only are they sick, and a lot of them are chronically sick now, and a lot of them will die sooner than they would have, they're not even getting the treatment that they need. So, so this windstorm of words around the legal settlements and everything is doing them absolutely no good. And, and to the next person, whether it's Porter Ranch or, you know, there's a fire in Santa Barbara right now that's burning close to an oil refinery. So what happens when that hap hits their oil refinery? You know, God, I hope it doesn't happen. But those tanks exploded. <clears throat> and now instead of ash falling all over Santa Barbara, it's oil particles. Are they going to evacuate the town? Are they going to give the proper health treatment and the proper testing for people? No, because it's not even in our system. Right. It's not there. Right. It's purposely not there. So, if you know, if you got a fracking well near you, all I can tell you is, whoever told you it's safe doesn't know it's safe, and whoever told you it's dangerous doesn't have all the facts either because the real money in the testing is not being done unless that person went to your water well and actually tested for the 800 dangerous compounds which I don't think they have it's more like children playing with matches yeah. why can't a doctor look at this girl you know who, who's losing her skin and say this girl has was ex, you know exposed to toxic chemicals 
What would happen in the 50s to a doctor who wrote down on a piece of paper that somebody died because of tobacco smoke? What would happen to that doctor? Uh, the tobacco industry would uh, threaten his life, I would imagine. Well, there you go. So the doctors, any doctor who would have the courage right now to say that a person is sick from chemical exposure from the, one of the largest, most powerful corporations and probably Jeez. arguably the most powerful industry that's ever been on the face of the planet, to have the uh, courage to diagnose chemical illness, that's a big deal. And you know, doctors are like everybody else. They got their dreams and their hopes for the future. They got kids. They got families to care for. That's a big move right now. So, and then nobody's there to back them up, by yeah, the way. Yeah. Like yeah. they don't have anybody there to back them up I, with any power. I hear that. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's really, um, you know, this interview could probably go on for like quite a while, but um, if, if we go just until the top of the hour, if that would be okay, um, just about 10 till, and then... Yeah, that's fine. I got, I got somebody coming in in about five minutes, so yeah, uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up over the next eight minutes. Great. Um, and Okay, so BP had a problem, and it, you know, it also lied about how safe the corrects it is. So, you know, initially, you could, you could even understand if BP messed up. I mean, of course, they wanted to save money in the first place, which is why this explosion happened to begin with. The well they knew had some faulty construction issue, which they ignored, which is why it blew in the first place. But then to just cover it up and then cover it up again. And, and just to this day, six years later, just, you know, consistently be in denial and deny the health that they caused all these health problems, not really don't care about themselves is, is what about, you know, your kids? Exactly. Thank willing you. To sacrifice your kids. Your kids. Dad, you know, it's like, it's like, honestly, I feel it's like if we're saying big oil is bad, it's like addicts blaming their dealer, you know, like let's take some responsibility as people addicted to oil. Right. Right. And let's start making some demands, like get in the game. As the lady said again, you're yeah, either at the right. table or